Open with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We'll read the first six verses. Primarily, in order to get to verse 6, which I would like to consider with you this evening. Looking together at the topic of sanctification, the practical aspects, how does sanctification work? What does it look like? What has the Bible said? What does the Bible offer for us with regard to our personal sanctification? Let's read 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, and in him the love of God, pardon, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Walking in the same manner as Jesus. This is what life for the Christian ought to look like. Following hard after him. There are lots of synonyms that we use to refer to sanctification. Growing in godliness, Christ-likeness, spiritual maturation, putting aside the old and putting on the new, the rooting out of sin, mortification of the deeds of the flesh. One thing that I want to consider Specifically with this idea of us maturing in our faith, following after Jesus, being conformed into his likeness, is that sanctification is synergistic. This is the way that Jerry Bridges describes it in his little book that's really helpful, Pursuing Holiness, in the introduction to the book. He describes sanctification in this way. He likens it to farming. Farming is a joint venture between God and man. In farming, man cannot do what God must do. Man cannot cause the rain to fall. He cannot call the sun to shine. At the same time in farming, God will not do what the farmer should do. God does not till the field and plant the seed and fertilize the soil. Sanctification is very much this way. God does not grant a perfect life of holiness at the moment of our salvation. Did it happen that way for any of you? Like holiness, practical holiness, instantaneous. It doesn't work that way. He requires us to pursue holiness. He does such a magnificent work inside of us that we can't help but wanting to be made like his son this one who gave himself for us. And not only does he require it, but he works within us to cause this growth. He accomplishes that which he has commanded. It's important that we understand sanctification as being synergistic. And by synergistic, I mean we must understand that it's a cooperation. There's a combined effort. Or we have responsibility in it. Now, there's a a strong focus, and rightly so, and a huge emphasis, and that's good, on the monergistic concept of regeneration and justification. It's God alone who saves us, who regenerates our heart. It's God alone who justifies us in the courts of heaven. Unfortunately, many among us have swung the pendulum of correction with regard to how God saves us, realizing that it is completely his sovereign kindness that saves us, we've swung the pendulum of correction too far, thereby wrongly assuming that we are sanctified in the same fashion that we are justified. 
and it simply isn't true. We want to bring the overcorrection back into a biblical balance and to avoid overcorrection with this of saying that sanctification happens by the sovereignty of God. He'll sanctify me whenever he gets ready. He'll, he'll move me forward. We want to, we want to avoid that overcorrection and the way to do that, along with every other overemphasis that we're prone to, is by taking a careful look at the Word of God, particularly into the life of Jesus Christ, into the God-man. The man that the Apostle John here says that if we abide in Him, if we say that we belong to Him, then we, we should walk in the same manner that He walked which means that we've got to know how he walked. We've got to recognize the pattern for his life, how he related to his father. And the gospels do that wonderfully for us. And in fact, that's what I want to spend the time this evening doing is looking at this man. How did he live? How did he relate to his father? That's the pattern for us. That is the pattern for our lives to follow after Jesus, the word became flesh, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, John writes. Jesus, the God-man, was glorious. But whose glory did John and others see? Who was he referring to? It wasn't the glory of Jesus. It was the Father's glory, the glory of God, right? Philippians 2 tells us Jesus emptied himself of revealed glory. He poured himself out into flesh like ours. We know that he appeared as a real man earlier in 1 John. We, we sat with him. We touched him. We watched him eat. He had flesh like ours. Jesus himself was not walking around like glowing in his flesh with some angelic halo on. He was a real man with real flesh like ours. So when John writes of seeing the glory, we beheld the Father's glory in this man, in the way that he lived, the choices that he made, the way that he talked, the way that he prayed. We'll see some of these things. In fact, John goes on to say, John 1.14, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. The Father's glory exuded through his life, everything about him. Jesus had laid aside, not his deity, but his exposed or revealed glory. We see this clarified in John 17 in the high priestly prayer when Jesus himself said, glorify me together with yourself, the glory which I had with you before the world was. Which again tells us Jesus had laid aside that, rightful, that glory that was rightfully his. He thought it not robbery, Philippians chapter 2. He laid it aside, poured himself out, all of himself, fullness of deity, dwelling in bodily form. And it is the radiance of his glory, Hebrews 1.3. The radiance of the Father's glory in the face of Jesus Christ that was being revealed as he lived here on earth. Jesus reflected outwardly the reality of the Father's glory. So what does John mean when he says, we beheld his glory? We saw it with our own eyes. We saw this glorious man. It's just in his everyday life, in the activities that he took up day in and day out, the way that he lived, the way that he talked, the way that he ate, the way that he drank, the way that he slept, the way that he prayed, the way that he preached, the way that he healed, in every aspect of his life, the glory of his Father was being put on display for people to witness. I mentioned that John had referenced this in the letter already, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This is chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And the life was manifested. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. 
What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How did Jesus' life reflect the Father's glory? Hebrews 1.3 tells us exactly that he was the exact representation of his nature. It wasn't a dim reflection of his glory. It was full, shining, an exact representation. He himself was God in the flesh. And Jesus, again in the high priestly prayer, gives us the responsibility of demonstrating that same glory. John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask on my own behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Listen to verse 22. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. The glory which you have given me, I've given to them. The glory that Christ had been displaying with his life, he's now giving us the responsibility, the obligation of doing the same thing. And verse 23 may be one of the most encouraging realities and truths in all of Scripture. So that the world may know that you sent me that, and that you love them. Jesus saying to the Father, so that the world may know that you loved them, us, in the same way that you loved me, Jesus said. No one's going to argue with whether or not God loves his Son. We often attempt to make arguments with God with regard to his love for us in, what, in, in forms of doubt. I mean, we're not taking him to task, but we're, we're always giving him reasons not to love us by the choices that we make and the lives that we live. But here Jesus is saying, God, work in your people so that the world might see that you love them in the same way that you loved me. To that, that ought to be wonderfully encouraging to us that God the Father, the creator of all things, the most glorious being in all of existence, who loved his son, who loves his son more than anything that we can ever imagine, we would never question that. He loves each and every one of his children in the same way. The pattern that Jesus took for reflecting his Father's glory is our same pattern. We just looked at it there in John 17. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. It's the exact same pattern. God sent Christ into the world to display his glory. Christ sent his people into the world to display the Father's glory. We follow the pattern of Christ. Now, there are differences. It it would be absurd for us to say that we do it in the exact same manner because... We cannot say, for example, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, you could say it, but you would be a liar and a heretic and a number of other things. But Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So there are differences between us and Christ, for sure. We are imperfect reflections. Christ was a perfect reflection. But the difference is only qualitative. We are imperfect reflections, but we are real reflections, real ones. We are called to follow the pattern of our Lord and to really display the glory of God in our world. Which causes us to ask the question, can I really follow Christ and his pattern? He was God in the flesh. I'm not God. I can't do that. Consider the Apostle Paul with me. He's essentially the same as us. He himself writes, this is the will of God, your sanctification for the Thessalonians, for us. God's will for you and for me and for every believer for all time is Christ-likeness. It is sanctification that is God's will. 
To the church at Corinth, the apostle writes, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. The pattern of Paul is the pattern of Christ. We have these clear patterns set out for us in scripture. When the apostle writes to the church at Philippi, these things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. What things was Paul learning and receiving and hearing and seeing? What what were they seeing in Paul? They were seeing him follow Christ. He's already said, I'm an imitator of my Lord. Again, 1 Thessalonians 1.6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Paul was able to say with humility, yet with confidence, if you follow my pattern in life, you're following the pattern of Jesus. Can we say that? Is it our desire to live lives to that degree that we could come to guys around us and say, listen, watch me live. Watch the choices that I make. I will lead you to the throne of grace. It will be helpful for you to look at my life and follow me. We see Paul doing that because he was following Christ. Can I really follow Jesus in this manner? Paul was quite convinced of the expectation for him to follow Jesus. What pattern of Jesus is to be imitated? De- definitely, it isn't expected that we would go out and pretend act, to act like little gods. But the way that Jesus walked in life in harmony with his father was not due to his defaulting to his deity. His discernment, his miracles, his refraining from sin. Jesus was a man. He was the God-man. And when we think of the responsibility that we have of sanctification, of being conformed to his image, we are too quick to throw out, but he was God. I'm not God. Yes, but he laid aside the rights that were his because he was God and poured himself out in human flesh. Still God, but laying aside, still essentially divine in every way, but had laid aside those rights and became a man and lived his life dependent on the Holy Spirit. Paul in the same way. The way that the Apostle Paul lived and ministered is not merely due to his apostolic authority. It's in the same way that Christ lived. The means by which Jesus lived ceaselessly before his Father is the means that we see displayed in the Apostle's life. And it's our pattern for living as well in absolute, utter dependence on the Holy Spirit. This is crucial because if if we aren't careful... We will rob Christ of his humanity. And if we take any bit of his humanness from him, our salvation is at stake. We have to have a substitute in him. We have to have a human as a substitute. He has to be divine, absolutely. But he must be a human as our representative. As fully human, he was a man of the Holy Spirit like no other. There was no comparison. John said, we saw his glory. He was affected by it. The glory of God is a weighty matter. It's it's a heavy reality. It's substantial in every way. It isn't just like packing peanuts. You've, you've opened up, there's some, I order books. That's the most common thing that I order. And there are some companies that still use packing peanuts, these little pieces of styrofoam. They make a terrible mess. But, but you know what I mean by that? You can imagine me just flinging out packing peanuts, little pieces of styrofoam. There's no weight there. The glory of God's not like that. It, it would be that in compared to throwing out pieces of lead that are substantial and weighty. This is the glory of God. When when John says we saw him, there was a weightiness to his life. Everyone who came into contact with him was affected 
by him. It, his reputation went before him. There was an outward shining of the inward reality of glory and holiness and purity and righteousness. The one who says he abides in Christ ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. That's the expectation for us. To be putting on display the glory of God in every arena, in every aspect of our lives. It was the approach of the Apostle Paul. I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. There are no loopholes, not for any of us. No loopholes in the command to be Christ-like. No if, buts, or whatever. We live in a culture that views God as weightless. There's no seriousness, definitely no weightiness. John chapter 10, if I do not do the works of my Father, Jesus says, do not believe me. Can we follow Christ in this manner? Can we go to classmates and coworkers and people in the community and say, you know what? If I'm not following the pattern of Christ and what the Bible says about Christianity, don't, don't believe me. Don't listen to me. But Jesus continues, if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father we must live like Christ. We must obey the Father. Only then are people accountable. The lack of weightiness, the lack of our effect oftentimes in evangelism and seeking to help people in their lives regarding the things of God is often due to our lack of doing the works of the Father. Our obedience gives a substantiability, a weightiness to our words. We know that to be true. When when we see someone's life and it's remarkable and there's a weightiness and the things that they do really matter, we give ear to them. We listen to their counsel. We're willing to follow them. The same will be true of those around us when we begin to follow Christ and to keep his commandments. In, our, in all our reluctancy to do, to obey, to strive, to work, we're failing to look at Christ and to see his clear standard set before us in the scriptures. I fear, specifically when the, within the past dozen years or so, with a resurgence of reformed soteriology, at least, if not reformed um, Christianity, that there is a promotion, a promoted aspect of Christianity, that it is just kind of come and sit at the cross and gaze at all that happened there. But here's the thing. Based on the scriptures, if it's Jesus who's on that cross that we're sitting and gazing at, we will not sit long because the scriptures are full of commands for us to get up and obey and go and tell others about the reality of what happened there on the cross and to exclaim the glory of sins forgiven. Christ's relationship to the Father's will is a fundamental issue. The reason that he got up every day and shook the dust from his hair is because he delighted to do the Father's will. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. I've come to do your will quoted in Hebrews from Psalm 40. There was a purposeful delight in this man. His pattern should be our pattern. What is your pattern for doing, for accomplishing his will? Christ's pattern in life in the very beginning, Luke 2, 49. I must do my father's pleasure. In the middle of his life, John 8, 29, I always please him. At the end of his life, in the high priestly prayer, John 17, 4, I glorified him while I was on the earth. From beginning to end, he sought to please his father, to honor and glorify his father. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Life, 
for Jesus was doing his father's work, following his father's will. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The ambition, the goal of Jesus' life was to do his father's good pleasure. The ultimate destination of Christ's journey is seen in every one of his steps along the way. He didn't just come in order to go to the cross, but we see the ultimate fulfillment all along the way. And every step along the way of his life was crucial for us. He was gaining for us everything that we lost in the garden, gaining that along with securing that we could never lose it again. The will of the Father is the rule of Jesus' life. (coughs) The Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. He sat with an open scroll, we might say, and saw what his father was about. Whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. I'm quoting from John chapter 5. Again, John 5, I can do nothing on my own initiative. This is the God man. This is Jesus talking. I can do nothing on my own initiative. I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Christ did nothing by permission, only by obedience. He looked at his father. He knew his father's will. And he did what was required of him. He didn't initiate anything of his own accord. He simply responded to who God was and sought to walk in his ways. The root of Jesus' obedience was love. John 14, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. This is how we prove that we love God, by doing what he has commanded us. It's the way that Jesus himself proved his love. A couple of specific patterns. The New Testament is wonderful. The Gospels are so helpful for us in looking at this man and the aspects of his life that are crucial for us. Can you imagine what it would be like attempting to figure out, so how should we use the Scriptures? Or how should we pray? The disciples felt that, but they also were able to see it in the life of Christ. We're able to see it with the scriptures, his pattern of praying. Hebrews 5, 7 tells us that he was heard because of his piety. His prayers were heard because of his reverent obedience to his father. He experienced like no man ever has an uninterrupted intimacy. There was no broken fellowship with the father. He was completely obedient. John 8, 29, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Obedience and the nearness of his father were hand in hand to Christ. He understood, I have the father's nearness with me because I always do what he commands. Because he loved the nearness of the father, he delighted to do the father's will. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. The disciples asked Jesus, Luke 11, when you pray, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. This answer regarding prayer that Jesus offers to his disciples was not just right orthodoxy. He's not just offering a theology of prayer, but he's offering a model for them, not a mantra for us to get up every day and say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But it's a model. It's not, it's not just teaching an accurate theology, but it was his life. And they knew that it was his life. In fact, That's recorded there in Luke chapter 11. Verse 1 of Luke 11 says, It happened that while Jesus was praying, after he finished, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. We've heard people pray and thought, Man, I wish I could pray like that. I mean, that's what's happening there in Luke chapter 11. But it's not just there. Luke 3, 21, Jesus was praying at his baptism. Luke 5, 16, Jesus withdrew away to pray. Luke 6, 12, Jesus prayed all night prior to choosing the 12. Luke 9, 18, Jesus slipped away after feeding the 5,000 to pray. Luke 9, 29, while Jesus was praying, 
The transfiguration takes place. Luke 10, 21, Jesus prayed, praised God, praying, praising God upon the return of the 70 that had been sent out. He wasn't merely teaching a pattern for prayer. He was patterning a life of prayer before them. They could see that. So it wasn't just hearing the remarkable truths coming from his lips as he's praying to his father, but they had seen his life. And they knew that there was a direct correlation between this man's praying and this man's living, between this man's communing with God and this man's obedience to the law. There was evidence of that. The pattern of prayer in the life of Jesus is our pattern. It is communing with our Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. But not just in prayer, but also Jesus' pattern of relating to the Scriptures. Luke 2.52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He kept increasing in stature. He kept growing. He wasn't born an adult. Only Adam and Eve were created fully mature. He kept growing, and and it requires basically no effort. It just happens. He kept growing in wisdom. He kept growing intellectually. And it requires a bit of effort for that. He kept growing in favor with man. There's, there's moral growth happening, which requires a bit more effort even. And he kept growing in favor with God. There was spiritual growth, which required more effort. Now, it sounds odd for us to say that Jesus grew spiritually, Right? I'm I'm just reading the text. Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Can Jesus grow spiritually? He grew in perfection at age five, and he grew in perfection at age 15, and he grew in perfection at age 30. He was perfect at each phase along the way, and he continued growing in perfection responding obediently, continually. What tool did he use to bring about this growth? The scriptures, the word of God. He responded to the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It was life for him. He fellowshiped with his father, not just in prayer, but in the scriptures. What is life to you? What changes must we make in order to imitate Christ in this way? We must be committed to getting to know this man, to be captivated by this Christ, this Jesus, that all the pleasure of the Father dwelt in. This man of the Holy Spirit par excellence. Jesus was always looking to the Father, always seeking to please him, always seeking to honor him, and always depending on the Holy Spirit to accomplish it, relying on the Spirit for strength in order to do his Father's will. The one who says he abides in Christ ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. We must follow Christ. We must follow hard after him. We must seek to please the Father. And we must seek to do it through dependence on the Holy Spirit. It is our obligation and it ought to be our delight to do the will of God. To get to know this glorious man who's revealed on the pages of the word, Genesis to Revelation, he himself tells us, it's all about me. We have the wonderful privilege of getting to know him, of communing with him, of following him, of choosing, making choices that are pleasing to him, living lives that are honoring to him. When the apostle is writing to the church at Ephesus, he closes chapter 3, that great prayer there. Now to him, to the Father, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power, 
the Holy Spirit that works within us, to him be the glory, to God the Father be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's, it's a wonderful passage, but don't miss to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, in the bridegroom and in the bride. God has determined that his glory be shown, be manifested, be displayed, be seen in our world in and through our lives, the way that we live. And it will happen if we walk with him, if we follow the pattern of his son, if we make use. It's, it's really remarkable when we realize that Jesus was fully man, that there's no default to his deity as he gets up on a tired Tuesday morning. He isn't saying, man, I'm really tired today. I'm going to put it in a default deity mode and not really seek the Lord and seek to honor him and live for him. It doesn't exist. He's fully man. He's, he's given up the rights to function as deity, we might say. And he's agreed to come and to be our substitute, our representative, the last Adam. And he's secured for us salvation. And for all those that he has secured salvation for, God has determined that the same glory that the Apostle John said, we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. God, the Father, Jesus praying to the Father again in John 17, you've glorified me, I've glorified you, now glorify them. God has determined for us to show forth his goodness and his grace, his kindness and his compassion, his mercy and his love as we live amongst our fellow people, within our homes, within our schools, within our workplaces, within our communities. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. May God help us to follow the pattern of Christ who not only did not default to his deity, he also did not forsake the use of the same means of grace that you and I have been given. He walked with his father in prayer and in the word in fellowship with other believers. We've been given the same privilege. Is it a responsibility? Is it an obligation? Yes, but it's a delight because we walk and commune and live with Christ, with God who made us by means of the spirit within and among us. May God help us to be a people that not simply say we abide in him, but may he give us grace to walk in the same manner as the God-man, Christ Jesus himself, walked. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you for the kindness that you've shown us in Jesus, for the gospel, for the reality that it is your power to salvation for all who believe. God, we thank you for conquering souls, for saving us, for plucking us out of the miry clay and putting our feet on the solid rock that is Jesus, our Lord. God, we thank you that you have preserved your scriptures, that we can see how Jesus lived. We thank you for the illumination of the spirit within, that we might know you and your will for our lives. God, give us grace and desire to obey immense mercy as we seek to apply the truths as they are in Jesus, as we seek to follow him wholeheartedly, as we seek to know you, to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. God, be merciful to us who are sinners. Use us to glorify your name. For the glory of King Jesus, we pray. Amen.